So, good morning. Um, we're here this morning, well, I'm going to present uh, kind of like a follow-up subject to our keynote this morning, which is all about instant response, and the beer, the beer farmers also mentioned instant response. Last year, I started working with a bunch of teams because it was like, you know, one hour to midnight, and most of the security teams didn't know what the frack they were doing about insert response or just general security in the face of GDPR. It was incredible to actually see how many security teams actually didn't have a focus on what activities they actually needed to do uh, in, in light of the upcoming GDPR. And most of that was because a lot of companies, and you know, you could probably also raise your hands if you're in this, that situation, if you were in that situation, is they took the whole exercise as a compliance exercise. So they had a bunch of really high paid consultants that came in and reviewed all their processes and procedures. But they didn't actually think about the actual implications of what could go wrong and how to manage an incident. So, does that sound familiar? The laughs have it. So who am I? Come on, wake up. Hmm. Okay, I'll do it the old-fashioned way. So my name's Thomas. Um, I've been doing security for probably over 25 years. I've been in the computer science industry for a lot longer than that. One of the things that I have have is I've both been in end user organizations, part of the instant response teams, and part of architecture teams, and I've also been in going from consulting into software, into the software development cycle as well, um, in product vendors. So I have a really broad vision, but my true love really is instant response, and just the processes around it, and procedures around instant response. I'm also the director of B-Size London, and I also I am on the board of the IWSA UK. If you want to know more about the IWSA UK, just come find me and I'll, I'll give you a quick chat about it. So, as you know, last year we saw the official start date of the GDPR, but GDPR isn't the only personal data focused uh, law or legislation that you might have to face. You know, there are others that are, that are there for the week, and there are others that are coming up. Um, one of the toughest is, after the GDPR, is probably the Turkish Personal Data Protection Law, where, you know, the CEO can actually go to jail if there's, if there's a personal data breach. There's also got, we've also got roadmap legislation. I mean, Canada's implementing one, Japan's implementing one, South Korea's implementing one. If you actually follow the EU trade regul trade agreements that are coming up, you'll probably see that the countries, the countries where we get, where the EU is going to have trade agreements with are actually implementing personal data laws. It's really strange. I wonder why. Um, anyway, so with this talk, I'm going to focus some of the things on GDPR. It's just because it's easier to talk about GDPR because everybody kind of knows about it and everybody's heard about it, right? If I start talking about the Turkish legislation, you're going to, what? Uh, right? <laughs> so we'll focus on most of the aspects around GDPR. So now, one of the things that you need to start with is how is your instant response process? What is it based on? So I've given, I have three examples here, right? So the one on the, on the left is the GDPR, work, uh, the IR process workflow that SANS teaches you, right? So it's preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, lessons learned. It's a very simple one. It's six steps. Um, but I found that in most cases, less and less gets dropped because you never have time, because you're fighting fires with another fire. How many of you think that's true? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> Quite a few, right? So the, the one on the right is actually very similar, except it's got a few extra steps towards the end. That is actually the NIST um, process. So what they've done is they've actually added uh, lessons learned is, is actually become review and communications, right? So there's, there's a little bit, it's a little bit more detailed in the types of pro process steps. The one in the middle, how many of you have seen the one in the middle before? I've heard of the one in the middle. Phew. So the ODA loop is basically a military tactic. It was developed uh, by Lieutenant Colonel of the US Air Force. Essentially, the position is, is that 
you're continuously in a state of alert. Uh, alert. So how do you manage that, uh, that state of alert and to be able to respond to something? The, 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 the concept is, is that you observe your environment to understand the environment, then you orient your thinking or you orient your detections towards what's important to you. If something happens, you decide what actions you're going to take until, and then you act, right? It's very similar to, the, to, to a standard IR workflow, except it's a lot more dynamic, it's a lot more, uh, it's a lot faster. You'll see this in mature organizations, mostly the ones that are going from traditional IR and traditional detections more into the threat hunting space and not what some vendors are calling threat hunting today, which is essentially just IR. But, or detections, but real threat hunting where you're going through, you're going through information and to try, to try and find something that you know, that your, not, your notables or your detections don't pick up. Um, I'm actually going to focus on the SANS one, only because I'm partial to SANS. I think it's a good organization. They teach very well and they've got, they've got good curriculums and it's, it's a little bit, it's more contextual for a lot of people. But the principles are always the same. So, when you're actually going to start looking at rebuilding your IR process to focus on personal data, you need to start, the first thing you need to do is understand what a data breach really means and, and what are the conditions under which a data breach is going to affect you. So to that point, you first need to understand some of the legislation. You need to understand what's behind the legislation. Now, most of the times what I do is I recommend you work with your legal team or your you know, compliance team because they've gone through this, they've tried to understand it. Trust me, you won't get a, a concrete answer. I've been with a number of organizations, I've talked to a number of organizations, each legal team has a different perspective on what you need to do, which is really confusing. But from your organization's point of view, the best is to work with the people that know how your organization's face is, is trying to understand personal data breaches. So you go with your legal team's decisions. If I take a look at the GDPR, these are the five points that are most important when you're looking at understanding how it's going to affect your incident response process. Of course, the key one is the 72-hour uh, report to the DPA. So how many of you, you know, if, do you think your IR process or your IR teams are able to actually notify in 72 hours? How many do you think that that's, pos that's current or you're not sure? You know, it's, there's a few of you put your hands up, so you've actually looked into this, right? The, a lot of organizations just don't understand what 72 hours actually means in terms of what you need to report. Um, yeah, because the second line is become aware of the breach. What does that actually mean, right? Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of definitions around that, but the key concept is, is that once you know that there's potentially a data breach, you need to report that. I'm going to skip the middle one because I'm going to come back to it later. The fourth one is really important. And this is the hardest one to understand from the perspective of security team is unless unlikely to result in risk to rights and freedoms of persons, right? What the hell does that mean? I mean, it's really, you know, if you break it down, it's essentially what they're talking about is if the personal data gets leaked, is it going to harm that person? And harm that person can mean a whole bunch of things. It can be physical or it can be financial or it could just be emotional, right? It could be just emotional trauma. There is no clear definition around this, right? So if you leak a bunch of email addresses, is that really going to harm somebody? How do you define that? And we really won't know this until somebody actually challenges this and it goes all the way to the European Court of Justice, right? So what you need to do is basically assume that anything that you think is potentially harmful to a person needs to be notified. And then, you, especially if you're dealing with personal data, so like if, if you're in a financial institution or if, you're, if you have a whole customer list that gets leaked, you're going to have to notify the data subject. And how that's not really the responsibility of the incident response team, but you need to provide correct information to your communications or to your DPO so that they can actually do the notification in a correct and proper manner. So we the next step, really, is to understand what the hell is personal data, right? There's a lot of discussions around what personal data is or isn't. If you look at the way it's, that it's been defined in the GDPR, it's actually quite precise, right? There's a lot of really good 
information in a GDPR. Now, one of the things that you need to, that there's two aspects to it, is that you have the article which talks about personal data, but the actual definition of personal data is, is in the recitals. So you need to go back from the article into the recitals, and as you can see, there's a lot of recitals to understand. That just gives you a little bit of details on what gets classified as personal data. But the important thing is to understand that it's any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. So an organization won't fall under this, or a company won't fall under this. A, a user in a company could fall under this because it's a natural person. Identified or identifiable means that you can correct directly, pick up that person, or you can use the information to identify them. And the key concept behind that is the last line, which is directly or indirectly. Right? If I have enough information to be able to go back and figure out who you are, even if it's not personally highlightable, let's say you get a password leak, for example, right? and the user uses information in the password, say like a place of birth, a date of birth, and potentially an email address associated to it, it might not be the actual person's name and uh, you know proper name, but because I'm also impacted by indirectly, if I can use that information to actually identify a unique individual, it falls under the GDPR. Now, for an incident response team, that's really important because not only do you need to understand what data is being leaked, but you need to understand how the data needs to, can be used. So when you're looking at password leak, you need to go back and look at the passwords and say, hey, wait a second, this password, I can identify this one unique individual. That becomes a personal data breach. Right, And that's kind of the stuff that you don't get out of a, a compliance exercise. So what is personal data? If you take a look at the vendor space, they talk about PII. Most of the PII is these very simple pieces of information, right? All around identifying a person, so name, date of birth, gender, maybe addresses, uh, maybe comms, maybe you know, credit card numbers, uh, simple things. But if you actually look at the definition and how you can uh, directly or indirectly identify somebody, this isn't enough. It's a lot more complex. It boils down to a lot more information. So I'm not going to, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go through these, but I'll leave it up for a sec. It's, you, you're going from anything that's related to your job, to anything in your mobile devices, to anything that's related to your health. To anything that's related to your IT devices, or you know, to, to a computer, so your broadband connection, IoT fits into this now as well, right? Alexa, for example, um, your financial status, credit card ratings, transactions, mortgages, loans, income tax, and anything related to your movements, right? To your car, to your tube access. I, I, I laugh because uh, a number of years ago, well, that was actually about a year and a half ago, so it was right before the start of GDPR, I used to work in the bank area in London. So I'd get on the tube, and one afternoon, I'm like walking down the tube, waiting because it's really busy, so I'm waiting in line to get onto the tube, and I see the sign at the entry. We are currently testing a solution that tracks your phone and uh, using your Bluetooth and your Wi-Fi. I'm like, mm-hmm. Okay, <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, where's the GDPR notice for this <laughs> kind of thing? Um, what are you going to do with the data? So, I, uh, funnily enough, a couple of years before, I had actually been on a project and uh, worked with an architect, a big data architect, who's working with TFL, and they were working on plans to basically track movements of people for one good reason. They wanted to track the movement of people in stations so that they could regulate flow and they could understand when peak hours are. But subsequently, they looked at it and they said, oh, wait a minute, we can do something like minority report. So when people come into this tube and they're going down the escalator, we can put targeted ads on the thing and we'll get more money from the targeted ads. I'm like, no, <laughs> you can't do that. No, sorry. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, there's, all of that falls under personal data. I mean, you can do it, right? There's nothing, it, there's not really anything in the GDPR stopping you from doing it. It's just you need to understand how that falls into personal data and what would happen if there was a personal data breach. So, I started to break this down into more technical terms and I started to make lists and I gave up because I basically, this is just a subset of what came out of it. The really important thing is that, like, when you look at 
things like physical appearance, right? There's all of these different types of physical appearances that you could track. Um, there's the yellow part is even worse because the yellow part is is what GDPR considers sensitive data. I haven't got I, you know I'm not going to dwell on sensitive data, but essentially sensitive data is data that technically you're not allowed to collect under the GDPR unless you have special permission. And it's all about union memberships, race, religion, um, and, and things like that. Very, but the problem is, you notice that on the top I put country specific, right? Why country specific? Well, think about the EU, right? It's 27 nations right now, right? How many of them are all ask, ask, you know, like Latin based? Half maybe? Once you start going towards the east, you start to introduce new character sets. You start to introduce Cyrillic type character sets. You start to introduce different naming conventions. You start to introduce a whole bunch of things. So not only do you need to track this in, say, English for the UK, but you also need to track it in all, this, in all the other languages as well, right? And all the potential other character sets. So you're complicating your task even more. So, data breaches. What do you consider a data breach? Or well, how do you handle it? Well, the first thing you do is, it's like, where am I going to actually focus my attention and insert response? Does anybody want to take a wild guess? So, you're going to focus your activities around preparation and identification. Preparation, you need to understand where everything is. You need to build a data, uh, a, an asset management of all the personal data that you're potentially storing or holding or processing. Identification is when you're actually going to detect something and take, a, take a, a action against uh, including notification. So in a data handling pr uh, pr procedure, this is um, a workflow that actually it's a base workflow that Eniza do documented and released uh, right before, yeah, a few years ago. So the first step, of course, is preparation, right? So we understand preparation. You're going to actually you're going to do an activity around preparing your incident response process. You're going to look at where is where is your personal data. The important part is actually when you get to event handling, right? So when you get to event, you get an event detection. Okay, you do your initial assessment, and you're going to want to understand is personal data involved. If it's not, then you just carry on your your your, initial, your standard workflow. If it is, that's when things start to get complicated. So the first thing you're going to do is you're actually going to have to notify your DPA to let them know that there's personal data involved. If the personal data could be detrimental to the user you're going to have to also notify the user. Now, of course, the IR team isn't going to do the notification, but the IR team needs to understand the impact of that personal data so that they can actually get the right people into the room and actually you know, get the right notifications to be sent out. The important part is understanding you know, what is compromised in this event. Is it a breach? What are the circumstances? What's the severity of the breach? And do you need a really good response or not? Now, I skipped ahead a bit, but the 72-hour portion of what you need to do in this incident response process is highlighted in that box, right? So it's just that phase. So if you have a, the ability to quickly assess whether the personal data is in, in, in play, that's where you're going to get your 72-hour notification in play. You don't need to do a detailed notification in that 72 hours. You just need to issue a notification saying, we have a potential data, personal data breach. We think there's X amount of, of records involved, and we're investigating. You file that with the ICO, and you carry on your investigation. So you carry on, you go into your further assessment. And that's where you're actually going to detail all of your, all of the evidence and you're going to gather all the evidence and you're going to look at how many p potential personal data records are in play. And then you do a detailed notification to the data, to, to the DPA, right? So the ICO in the UK. Once you've done that, you go into containment recovery. And the important thing is you need to do, you need to keep a data breach inventory. 
You need to be able to actually historically capture what happened, when it happened, and what was involved. Because if, let's say you do a notification, you, you work through it, and you realize, okay, this isn't really detrimental to the user, but a year, a year later, you find out more information has been, been leaked, and, that, and somebody starts to complain, you need to be able to demonstrate that you actually, what you knew at what time, and what to what extent. Then you go into your lessons learned, which most people never really do properly, and you go back to your preparation phase and fine-tune your, fine your process. So, what qualifies as a breach, right? So when is a breach not a breach? So, would you all agree that exfiltration is a breach? You're all doing that? I mean, that's the standard one. Data's been leaked, it's a breach, right? Destruction. How many of you are monitoring for destruction and notifying based on destruction? This morning, Todd, a keynote, he talked about WannaCry and companies not notifying that they've been hit by, by ransomware. Technically, if that ransomware touches personal data, it's a violation of the GDPR and you have to notify. So companies that aren't notifying when they get ransomware are potentially in, in, in breach of the, G, of, of the GDPR, for example. It's like, that's what I laugh when I saw articles from newspapers and from vendors saying that the next big risk of personal data is, is, com is uh, malicious, ac malicious actors ransoming uh, you know, access to the personal data so you don't get a GDPR fine. The problem is, is they've touched the personal data, they've seen the personal data, so it's a violation of the GDPR, whether you pay them or not, right? What about alteration? How many of you are monitoring for alteration? Right? GDPR says the personal data should only be modified by uh, upon request from the data subject or within the limitations of your privacy policy. What about unauthorized disclosure? Now you're going to tell me, oh, unauthorized disclosure is exfiltration. There's a slight difference. Unauthorized disclosure is when somebody, uh, for example, if you attach a credit card list and you send an email out by accident, right? There's a difference between an exfiltration and an actual, you know, not like something that, that's unauthorized because it's a mistake or because it's just, it's not really an ex, it's not really a tar you know, targeted attack type thing. And the final one, which gets everybody, unauthorized access. How many people are monitoring for unauthorized access in their instant response? And, you know, it, it, if I've got a couple, Maybe. The problem is, is that what happens if, let's say, an admin goes into an HR database and he's not allowed to go into that HR database and he does select staff from people? That's unauthorized access. There's not many companies that are actually looking for that and clearing an incident based on that. Right? Um, big data projects. That could potentially lead to unauthorized access as well. So there's, there's plenty of places within this, the, 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 these aspects of the GDPR that are missed in the incident response process because you don't think about it from the incident response process. You're thinking exfiltration. You're thinking malicious actor taking my data and, and leaking it out of my organization, right? You're not thinking about some guy coming in and deleting your database. So preparation phase. So how do you prepare? Well, you, the first part, really, aspect, really, is to understand your environment and adapt your existing models. Most most companies already have an instant response model. They already had a threat model. They've threat, they've they've identified their, their, their gaps. They're trying to fix their gaps. They've identified their weaknesses and put in controls in place. What you need to look at is re-evaluating all those controls and looking at where personal data fits in and you assign personal data attributes to those controls. So if you say, like, have a control that's monitoring uh, an HR system, that's automatic, you know, that, that's the obvious choice of flagging it with personal data attributes. You then go back and identify the new risks, right? Look at the new risks. Now, I like to use a, DP, uh, a data protection impact assessment. You don't need to do one for every piece of data, according to the legislation. But I like to use it because it actually helps you understand what the risks are around personal data and how you're going to how you're going to how you're going to impact how you're going to determine the impact potential impact. And of course, you need to think about what you're doing. 
and try to identify and understand if this data leaks, will it harm the data subject? I know a lot of organizations by default, they just say if any personal data is involved, they'll notify. But you don't necessarily need to do that. And that's where the, that's where there's a good understanding of what personal data is being kept where and how it's being processed will help a lot. So this is a, this is a really good DPI workflow process. It's published by the French DPA, La CNIL. It's in English as well as French. But it takes you through the steps of what you kind of need to do to, to do a, a, data, a, a personal data impact assessment. Now, I use this as kind of a key to, helping, to help understand how data is being processed and where the controls need to be. So it's very interesting to, uh, to look at those key elements of where things are stored, how they're stored, how they're processed, so that I can evaluate the risks and then look at the controls and the mitigations that need to be in place. They actually have, they also actually have a tool which you can, it's an open source tool which you can use to actually do the impact assessment. The other thing that I use, which is really handy, is the actual, is a project from uh, Dennis Cruz at, and OWASP, where they were looking at creating what they call the data flow mapping, so the personal data journey. The concept is, is that in most cases, IT teams don't really understand what the application is doing or what data they're, they're managing. So what they wanted to do was actually look at how to talk, to talk with the business and how to understand how data moves around and what data is being processed. This personal data uh, journey flow mapping actually helps you do that and I've you know I've talked to a lot of businesses and, and shown them this and they understand that this is really beneficial because you can actually put things into perspective when you're talking to business people right or to application owners because a lot of times they don't understand what a what you know an IT control is or they don't understand what security control is so if you bring it back down to the basics what you're doing is you're actually speaking their language and you, you get a better understanding of where things lie the, the essential as, the aspects of it is you determine what data source, it, what the data source is. So if you're a controller or if you're a, a collector, um, then you look at the types of data subjects which you are accessing, the categories of individuals, then you look at the personal data being collected, then you look at the, what processing needs are, are being fulfilled, what's happening. Then there's different aspects. You're going to look at the lawful processing. You're going to look at the data retention because that's important as well to understand how long the data is supposed to be there or not and get rid of. You're going to look at who you get, who it gets sent to if you have data processors. So that's going to have to fall under your incident response plan to understand potential data leads coming from them and how you're going to react to those. Whether you're transferring them to a third party in a third, in a third, in a different nation and what security you have in play, right? Because you have to do the, uh, personal data uh, data security by design. It, so you're looking at things like is everything encrypted on transit? Are you encrypting uh, you know, non uh, uh, um, so lost my train of thought. Um, what kind of security you have in play? What controls you have? Uh, look at what the application security is, is about. How you're doing identity and authentication? Are you using a, a multi-factor and things like that? One of the first interesting finds that the, that was issued uh, along the GDPR was by the French DPA, where they issued a fine to an advertising company because they weren't protecting passwords. Right, the passwords were stored in clear text. Funny enough, uh, it was it was they actually declared it to the CNIL, and then the CNIL, the CNIL turned around and said, "Oh, well, this is a violation. You, we're going to have to fine you." If you do it, once you've done it, basically this is what it would look like once you've gone through the process as you've actually highlighted you know, the, that you're a controller. For example, this is an HR workflow maybe. You're looking at employees and recruitment. You're looking at the contact details. You have a personnel file. Uh, the lawful modes of processing, how long you're retaining it, uh, where you're sending it, so HMRC, bank, uh, maybe if you're an international company, you're storing it both in the EU and the US, or if you're using the cloud, you're storing it both in the EU and US, and what kind of protections you have on the, on the existing, on the data, on the data itself. So this helps you put context on where personal data is, is sitting and how it's being used, which will help you identify what 
controls you need to put in place to actually do the detections. Understanding where data lives is one of the hardest things you'll ever do as part of a security team because nobody really knows where it is. So the first choice is to do an e-discovery right, aspect. So discovery methods, once you go past the talking to people and trying to understand where it lives, you have the possibility to do it technically, right? There's three ways of really doing it. Fingerprinting patterns or regex. Fingerprinting, the problem with that is that you need to know what data you already have so that you can create that fingerprint and you can go search for it. Pattern is more of a keyword search, so you need to have really well predefined keywords. So it, it works okay if you have fields and you can identify the fields. But in most cases, what you end up doing is you, you end up doing regex. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll notice, you'll, you'll see from time to time see that I just say it's, there's nothing like regex, right? You need to use regex. Understand regex. It's, there's nothing better, right? Everybody does regex, right? Everybody does regex? No? <laughs> um, finding the data, basically, you talk to data owners. We've done this. I can't insist enough on talking to data owners because they are really the ones who understand the data. You crawl your environment, you build a map so that you can focus your detections. Crawling the environment, you can either use proprietary tools, or you can try and do it with Perl or Python, which are good text manipulation, manipulation languages, right? So you need to find that data, right, and build that map so that you can understand where you're going to focus your, your controls. I know I'm being very repetitive, but so I found it's the only way to get, really get people to understand that this is the most important part of what you're doing. Here are some examples of regexes. For, I'm trying to build a database. I just haven't been focused on it as much as I'd like to. If you have any input, just feel free to, to, to drop me a line or submit them to my GitHub. But I've got some UK example regexes. I've got Greek regexes in the middle. Uh, some of them are repetitive. So like a passport, you can probably repeat, except that you have, you, if you want to identify nationality, if you want to identify the country, you're probably going to put the free, the, uh, you're going to have the free letter country code, ISO country code in the middle. So you, so you'll probably end up building regexes for every country. But how the hell do you find this stuff? Right? CCTV, call desks. How many of you have call desks that record the record, that do a recording for quality control? That's personal data. Right? How do you put controls on this stuff? How do you actually find this stuff? In most cases, it's pretty well localized, right? It's pretty well localized to a system. So you classify and you put protections around that system. The problem is sometimes it doesn't. Like CCTV might actually be a third party that's running it for you and they're storing it somewhere else. So there's a whole bunch of extended aspects to looking at this from the incident response process that we miss a lot of times, right? Because we're focused on the applications. We're not focused on where the data is actually coming from or where the data actually resides. What about this? Application logs. How many of you deal with developers in your organization? Number. How many developers forget to turn off debug? So you got debug, and you put, uh, you know, print to, to log, username, pass, or password, maybe not, but username, name, date of birth, so to, te to test. That automatically classifies those logs as personal data. And this is stuff you, know, you don't think about, right? When you're looking, at, you're looking at, you're focused on the application and the data that resides in the application. You're not thinking of anything that's going on on the site. That's an important part. And I, you know, I've told a lot of people, it's like, have you really thought about the extent of the personal data that you're actually checking and the controls that you put into place? So how do you identify? Once you've done the preparation, you now have, technically, you have a personal data asset, man asset management system, or you have an asset database, right, of all the locations where you've got personal data, which is very useful, because then you can actually use that information to build controls. There's two ways to build controls. You can either do passive, so that goes back to the data discovery, or just marrying a data discovery to your SOC and SIM activity. Or you can do an active detection using an endpoint or network solution. 
But essentially, the, the, the whole aspect of it is once you have run your data discovery and you understand you have your asset database, you can actually create a list of locations where data resides, what personal data resides. Once you understand that, you can extract those personal data locations uh, either as paths or specific applications or IP addresses or DNS, you know, DNS names, anything that will help you identify where personal data lives and you can feed those into endpoint or network rules. The idea being that you're going to look at triggering or, or generating an event for every time a user accesses personal data. Once you've done that, you can basically trigger your network detections and send them back to your event database, or your monitoring console, or your SIM, whatever you're using. Similarly, once you, once you have those personal data locations, you can create lookup tables, build focus queries within your, within your event database, build focus queries within your SIM, create rules using those lookup data so that you can trigger notables, right? So think about the HR example I gave earlier, a, a, a sysadmin that's connected to an HR database and does select staff from people. If you understand that that database is there and you can monitor for commands like select star, then you can trigger a notable saying somebody's dumping a database. Once you have that, you can build your notables, alert notifications, you can build dashboards around personal data, you can build reports. The report part is probably for me the most important aspect because that report part is going to allow you to extract reports and feed them into the whole process of personal data breach and notifications. Once you've done that, you can trigger your, your, your IR process. Once you get a notable and you understand what's going on, you trigger your IR process, you do the forensics, and you've got all the notifications going out. So what about tools? So for the discovery part, you've got one, I've only actually ever found one free tool. If you know of any, I'd be happy, you know, I'd be grateful because the only one I've ever seen is freeed.org and that basically hasn't had much work done on it in, in donkey's years. The others are all basically commercial. Uh, same with the detections. So you can use commercial products, you can use for the cloud, you can use CASB, you know, some of the next generation products are starting to integrate things like personal data detections. But more importantly, you can actually use Sysmon collecting event IDs, or you can use WI and, uh, WMI and Sysmon if you're actually doing that. So you can actually focus those two product, those two components of a Windows to actually look for data. In Linux, you can use Audit D, right? So in Audit D, all you have to do is create your controls, push them out to your servers, and send, and send the logs to the SIM and monitor those logs. In Windows, you can kind of do the same thing if you're actually capturing event logs and, cent and centralizing them. You can use a local policy to audit object access. The problem with Windows is that to actually audit a data, ob a data access or data manipulation, you're not looking for one event, you're actually looking for three or four events. Right, because it, you get basically a handle to 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 an object was requested, an attempt to access the object was done. It might be deleted, it might be edited, but and then you get a close. So you've, you've got those four. You're essentially creating four events. You have to uh, uh, synchronize four events to understand what's happening to the to the to the data, which I find really annoying and really hard to do. That's why I kind of like using the Sysmon approach a little bit better. So, you're augmenting your sims. Jesus, why did I start saying so, so much? <laughs> you're augmenting your sims, you feed your, your data into, the, into your sim, you capture those file events. It's not just about you know, copying externally, it can be edit a file, it can be delete a file, it can be modify a file. You feed that into you feed that as lookups into 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 say Splunk, Cameo, ArcSight, whatever you're using, and then you can actually build detections. So this first one, the top one is is an output from Humio. I'm just basically looking at all my personal data paths and on source file and destination file path. This that kind of search is very noisy because it just shows you every event associated to any personal data object. The search below, oops. This search here is for Splunk, and essentially what it's doing is it's looking for any network uploads uh, to one of the cloud service providers or the cloud you know, storage, storage elements. And the same, same thing, we're looking at source file path, looking at look up the personal data, and we do, do, we're just doing a dedupe. This also is very noisy, but it 
and it's specific to a certain endpoint agents. You can do the same. This this one is another uh, Splunk search where we're basically looking for any file write, file copy, file move, file delete against allowed users. So here I'm actually targeting users that are allowed to do this operation or not allowed to do this operation. And we have a restricted personal data path. The idea here is if you have, like, so for example, HR data, only an HR admin can touch it. So he'd be in the list of allowed users. The restricted personal data paths would be HR paths. Anybody that's not in the allowed users and touches one of those paths gets a notification saying, you know, this is, well, it gets, triggers an event. Basically, a not, non not unauthorized access. So, that's, that, you know, you can build lots of examples. These are just some of the examples. What about notification? So notification really isn't the incident response process, uh, person's problem, right? It's not really part of the incident. When you get to it, incident response, uh, Todd talked about it this morning, you have to have the right people in the room. And now you also have to have the right information in the room as well when you're actually escalating. So the, the, the information that you need is Number one, the number of individuals and the category of individuals concerned. You also need the number of personal data records concerned. Why is this, you know, the, the obvious difference is that an, indiv an individual might have multiple personal data, most personal data entries inside your organization. So maybe it affects multiple personal, inf personal data information for that one individual. The name and the contact of your DPO, hopefully you have that already. That changes based on the structure of your organization and where the actual incident is occurring because you might want to report it in France if it's your French affiliate that's affected. You might want to port, you know, a lot of the cloud-based organizations are using the DPO in Ireland as, as uh, the DPA in Ireland as, as their authority. So there's different aspects of that, but that's usually a legal issue and that's usually the legal team that will direct you in the right play and will play the right DPA. Likely consequences. This is where the incident response team can have an input, right? Because we're all security professionals. We know what can be done with the personal data to a certain extent. Mitigations and remediation efforts. That's important because when you do your notification, you need to be able to tell the DPA what you're doing to stop it from occurring or continuing or what you're going to do to stop it from occurring in the future. Because in theory, you should have had all of these controls and block and, 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 and security as a security Jeez, I'm losing my words. You should have the security, the security in place to protect the personal data. If you get a breach, that means that your security aspects haven't been as good as you thought they were. So you need to be able to tell the DPA that you're re-looking re at what controls you have in place and what security constraints you're putting into play around the personal data so that it won't happen again. It's important because that, that will go into the decision of what happens when the ICO or the, will take a look at fining and, and punishment. Evaluating the severity, um, I refer back to Enzo as well. They actually did a personal data breach severity assessment methodology, and it's quite interesting because if you look at the chart on the on the right, they actually they've actually categorized based on the level of effectiveness, right, or, or how it'll affect the personal data. You know, the lowest being just annoyance, right? So re-entering passwords, updating your 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 email addresses in certain places, what. It's annoying, but it's not really critical to your, to to your to to you as, uh, and it's not really harmful to that person. While the worst is very high, which is significant irreversible consequences. So, for example, you you know they get access to your bank account and they enter your bank account, right? That is, or it creates substantial long-term psychological, physical things. So maybe you know the personal data gets out that you're, that, you know that you're you're part of an LGBT organization, and it gets leaked to people, and it affects you, affects you morally. You have problems with that, and you know it leads to all the mental health and mental health issues. So that's the kind of thing that you're going to look at evaluating. Again, this is probably not something the incident response team needs to do by itself, but it's something important to understand because you can help actually direct an understanding to the legal team what could happen with the personal data that's been leaked. Now, I typically, I do, so I like to do a session, a slightly longer session, where I actually throw out questions to the audience, right? 
to uh, to help them understand, but also to help you work through. I'll put I'll put these up for a while. We'll, I, we'll, we'll actually do the session because we're running out of time, but. I'll put these up. These are good questions to ask yourself when you're looking at your IR process and how you're handling personal data breaches. So things like how you, what, how your legislation and compliance requirements made you change your IR process. Have you changed it? You know, what model are you using? How do you adapt that model? What events are you looking for when you're doing a data breach? Are you including personal data in a red team exercise? How do you test that? How do you know if it's working? Um, what's your definition of PII? Where do you store the personal data? Where is it stored? How do you track when it's stored, when it's taken away from the application, for example, and stored locally? How do you identify the personal data? Who needs to be in your revised information response team? And when do you call them? Final thoughts. Data breaches are here to stay, right? We're not going to get rid of them. The whole point of GDPR is not to stop them from happening or not to punish you because they're happening. The point of the GDPR is that you need to be able to take, the organizations need to take measures to protect personal data. Funnily enough, I got a few notifications, including the one from BA, right? But I got some of these two notifications from my have been pawned. Uh, what I didn't understand was why I got these. This the Outlook one. I, I, I've never even registered on this site. I have no idea where it came from. And this one, I found out. I, I basically what you do is when you get one of these, is you the first thing you do is you file uh, you file a subject access request to the to the organization to find out why they have your personal data. Because especially if you don't recognize why, I, I did that. I've never been to these sites. This one has never responded. This one responded in time, and interestingly enough, they didn't have that much personal data, they just had my email address. But the funny thing was, is that it was because I clicked on a link to do a share of an article like four or five years ago. And I'm wondering, why the hell do they still have that information after five years? What's the point, right? So, you need... To, there's a lot of things to do, right? And from the security point, point, team's point of view, there's a lot of work. Oops. Wrong button. So that's it. Questions? I've, I've dulled you into submission. Plus it's lunchtime, so I know. It's like I always get put before or after lunch, which is really annoying. <laughs> Now we good? That's a question up there. So we have quite good information to cover this gross public relations, a real black spot of email, and we do it for a number of reasons. Some of our emails can be being encrypted, some of this one, but some of them are saying so it's very hard to find. And that's where most of us make a mistake, which is where the recruitment of the other services are. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, what I would in that situation, your best bet is is an endpoint technology that actually can see the email before it gets encrypted, so you can track it when it's coming in and out. Uh, it's the best answer I have for you because it is a really big problem. Once, once it's encrypted, it's technical. So once it's encrypted, it falls within clear parameters of data protection and encryption in transit. The problem is, is you don't understand what's being sent. And the only way to understand what's being sent is to look at what's happening from the sender's point of view, right? So if you're, if you're using a cloud, if you're using a cloud service, you can usually get through that because you can put something like, uh, I mean, like if you're using Office 365, even before it gets encrypted, you, you can put the D, a DLP agent on the Office 365 interface and all, get, especially if you're using the web interface. If you're using endpoint, Email, email, system, email clients, you need to have something on the endpoint that's going to read the email before it gets encrypted. That's going to be able to process the text buffer essentially. Which is really hard, which is really hard, really annoying and works on and off. Uh, it's, it's a dead, I mean, it's a complicated issue. I've worked with some organizations. Basically, what we turned, we did is we looked at identifying 
when the user was actually maybe copying a CV or maybe copying personal information locally before it gets sent, sent out. So we were doing it, we try to do, what we try to do is do event association. So you're looking for a, you know, maybe access to the HR application or access to the, to the, to the tracking out to the um, database. When that user accesses that database, copies information locally, you have, you, you know that it's, he's basically copied a piece of personal data information locally. That doesn't, that's not necessarily a violation, but then once you, let's say a few seconds later or a few minutes later, you see an email go out to an external to an external email address. You can flag a you know low risk type of event and investigate it further if you need to. The idea being that you actually you know you you generated an event so you know that something happened, but you're never going to be sure. It's a, it's a hard it's a it's a difficult problem. Uh, So okay, so redaction requests. That's a good. That's a good point, right? So if you get a, a a subject access request to remove any personal data, the, the, the legislation actually says to you the best of your abilities, right? So if you don't, so it, it's the same problem with database backups, right? What happens is is that it, let's say you have database backups and you have both online and offsite, off, off you know, offline backups, right? Offline backups usually on tape. How do you actually delete one personal piece of information from a tape? You can't, right? It's, it's an impossible task. So the recommendation is essentially you build an asset database of, of, of subjects that I ask you for, that have been asked for a, a, you know, issued a subject access request for, to right to be forgotten. You keep track of those names so that when you do a restore, when you're rebuilding re data, when you're rebuilding personal data, you don't actually re-add that name. Right, so you need to update your process in terms of how you're actually processing and keeping track of what data needs to be deleted or not. It doesn't help with the email issue, but in f he, he, there's there's an aspect of you need to trust your people to a certain extent. It's, it's not easy. It's not easy. Any other questions? Uh, Yeah. In terms of access and personal data, I would say we don't need to come back up to the organization that has a commercial organization for. When does the integrity of each access come in a while? Oh, that I really can't answer because I'm not a lawyer. Um, Yeah, so the computer, the CA, was it computer, uh, CFA, the Computer Fraud Act, whatever it is, it, it is behind versus what the Data Protection Act is. When does it become a criminal act? That I don't know. Well, the, the, the aspect is if you have a malicious actor, um, whether internal or external, and they access data and they, you know, they exfiltrate data, that's, well, the external actor definitely falls under CFA, right? But the internal actor, that really depends on, on your, um, end user policy. It will depend on the privacy policies, or, you know, the data, whatever data policy you have in place. For, I mean, I know from, press, from the personal data perspective, unauthorized access is really falls under what's your privacy policy and how did you collect the data. If you collected the data and you said uh, it's going to be used only for HR to be able to evaluate, evaluate your candidacy for the job, then technically that data can only be shared with the people in that process, right? If an admin comes in, opens the data, copies it, or prints it, that's a violation. Is it, a, is it a legal violation? Is it a, a criminal act? No, it's not. It's just some admin that's taken, you know, excessive steps. Can, you know, will you probably fire the guy? Maybe, right? Because he, he you know, he overstepped his boundaries. 
when it comes to criminal acts, I I'd have to defer to a lawyer to, to really understand. You'd have to defer to a lawyer to to look into that. Because uh, internal, I don't see very many criminal acts unless you're actually, you know, blackmailing the company or selling the data on, online or something like that. Right? It's past this phase of, of the of the breach. Any other questions? Mm-hmm. I use trial and error. Trial and error works really well. Well, that, that, that's one of the reasons I'm trying to build this database of of detection patterns because it's it's really hard. I mean, even some of the passport ones they trigger false positives like crazy. The, the national insurance number triggers triggers F false positive all the time. Uh, you know, the French have a national ID. It's like a 12-digit number. Uh, you, you can't, there's, there's, a, there's a, well, there's a national ID, but there's also a medical ID. The medical ID, you can actually kind of reduce the false positives because the first tw uh, 10 digits are fixed based on your, your sex, year of birth, country of birth. Well, actually, it's a department of birth. <laughs> And so a couple of other fixed organization, uh, administrative information. So you've got that first 10 digits, you can relax it. But then afterwards, it's just a bunch of numbers. So, that, so that makes the reg, that complicates the regex enormously. It is a lot of false positives, right? I, we, I've done e-discoveries with a couple of companies. After the first day, we, we hit like one to five million entries. And the guys just said stop because this is this number one. It's not very useful. Number two, it's like we don't want to know. <laughs> I'm like you're gonna have to know in the future, so you, yeah, uh, we'll stop. But at some point in time, you're gonna have to address this because even if we, even even with false positives, we we had fine tuned um, the regexes to a specific set of information that they were collecting that they knew they were collecting, and we reduced the false positive rate to about ten fifteen percent. <laughs> So even on five million entries, ten, fifteen percent, it's not you know compared to the positive entries, it's not that much. And usually, what I found is that it, when you get into that stage, is that especially if you're doing e discovery, you're trying to build that asset asset database. As most organizations tell you, to piss off because essentially you've generated so much data that they just don't want to know the problem about the problem. That's that's a different matter altogether, right? But at the end of the day, some organizations just don't want to handle it. They'll deal with the fine when it if it happens and when it happens. Oh, we're, we're time's up. I think lunch is next, right? Yeah. Thanks everybody for listening. <laughs> <laughs>